How is it that an 18 year old woman goes from being otherwise healthy to being found unresponsive in her bedroom without any illicit drug use or prescription medication in her system? And did she really die of a caffeine overdose? That's the same question her family and the medical examiner's office had, which is why they did an autopsy. It also has me wondering, as someone who drinks a ton of coffee most days of the week, how much is too much? After all, I've had multiple people tell me in the comments section, you look so tired. I've even made a video called, why am I so tired all the time. Someone even sent me this caffeine alternative, which is supposed to help with energy and focus, but does it work and is it safe? And will I actually try it instead of drinking coffee? So many questions that need answers, so let's get to it. Caffeine is the most widely consumed legal stimulant naturally found in the leaves, seeds and fruits of various plants like coffee, tea, cacao, guarana, and others. When relatively low doses are consumed, severe side effects are uncommon. However, larger concentrations of caffeine are now being added to energy drinks or they're being taken as dietary supplements. Clinically, caffeine intoxication presents with headache, nausea, vomiting, even a little bit of a fever. It can cause anxiety, hyperventilation, dizziness, and tinnitus. Also, tremor or irritability, or agitation. In overdose cases, high blood pressure or even low blood pressure, arrhythmias and seizures have been reported. Although the acute level of caffeine consumption has yet to be established with certainty, it's thought to be around 10 grams per day in adults, which is comparable to consuming around 100 cups of coffee. However, it can be difficult to determine the cause of death in patients who do overdose as they lack specific diagnostic signs and symptoms. Therefore, blood caffeine concentrations can be used to help make a definitive diagnosis in such instances. There's only been a few fatal caffeine intoxication cases reported in the medical literature. The researchers in this study found that out of 15 cases of people who overdosed on caffeine, there's only seven that were fatal. In this case, we have an 18 year old woman. She's five foot three inches, weighed 103 pounds, was found dead in her bedroom. Although she had been suffering from depression, she was not taking any medication for this. A large amount of vomit was seen around her mouth and her room contained 258 empty blister packs. Each of the individual tablets in that blister pack contained caffeine with a concentration of 200 milligrams per tablet. Now an autopsy of her systemic organs was done 17 hours after she died. Her heart weighed 210 grams and had no observable coronary artery abnormalities. Her brain, weighed 1,540 grams and was swollen. Her right and left lungs weighed 130 grams and 160 grams, and there was 135 grams of gastrointestinal contents, which contained many drug particles. There were large amounts of gray-white particulate matter uh, observed from the mouth to the upper intestine, and there was diffuse bleeding of the gastric mucosa. Histopathology showed mild erosion of the stomach associated with hemorrhage. There's also brain edema and nonspecific changes in the heart lungs, liver, and kidneys. As for the toxicology, alcohol levels were negative. There were large amounts of caffeine in many of the tested samples, including over 22,000 micrograms per gram in the stomach, 290 milligrams per liter in the peripheral blood, and 149 milligrams per liter in the urine. The cause of death was determined to be intentional fatal caffeine intoxication. What about the world's strongest coffee, which is apparently Death Wish Coffee? Well, that has an estimated 300 to 700 milligrams per cup. There's numerous dietary supplements, over-the-counter drugs, and various prescription drug mixtures, especially for migraine headaches, that contain caffeine with doses ranging from 30 to 200 milligrams. Caffeine is rapidly absorbed in the gut, and clinical effects are observed within 15 minutes with peak plasma levels attained within one hour after ingestion. Typically, a dose of 50 to 200 milligrams is enough to achieve mild stimulation of the brain. Experiments investigating the toxicity of oral caffeine in animals revealed that the lethal dose was 200 to 400 milligrams per kilogram in rats. As for humans, it's estimated that the fatal blood concentrations are 80 to 100 milligrams per liter, which means a person would need to ingest about 50 
to 100 tablets of 100 milligrams of pure caffeine or chugging 10 to 20 cups of death wish coffee. During sleep, adenosine is recycled and levels are reduced in the brain. Less adenosine receptor stimulation leads to more alertness. While caffeine is structurally similar to adenosine, which actually blocks the adenosine receptor. So it increases the intracellular calcium concentration in all of this in the extreme can trigger a seizure, it could also trigger arrhythmia. As for the 18 year old female in this case, there still remained many drug particles in the stomach and the mucosa of the stomach showed mild erosion without any inflammatory cell infiltration, which means that the blood caffeine concentration rapidly increased and she died before the inflammatory cell infiltration could take place. Her blood concentration was 290 milligrams per liter, which is similar to concentrations found in previously reported fatal caffeine overdoses. The exact mechanism of death was not determined, but the suspicion is that it was due to a seizure or brain swelling, as it's possible that the caffeine caused the seizure. It's also possible that the caffeine excess caused brain damage specifically in the pons and the medulla, effectively shutting down the breathing control center, leading to a respiratory arrest. So how much is too much? Up to 400 milligrams of caffeine a day appears to be safe for most healthy adults. Caffeine in the powder or the liquid form can provide toxic levels of caffeine. In fact, this 39-year-old man, he ingested 12 grams of pure caffeine in hydrous. His autopsy blood caffeine levels were 350 milligrams per liter. Just one teaspoon of powdered caffeine is equivalent to about 28 cups of coffee. Even though I consider myself a coffee addict and have no plans of quitting anytime soon, I probably should drastically cut down on my caffeine intake. And I was curious when someone sent me this caffeine-free energy booster drink. Uh, it has claims on here that it's a natural, clean, and safe everyday formula that elevates you into a better state of being by helping your body make more of its own energy, ATP. This breakthrough formula helps keep your body moving, improve your blood flow, and sharpen your mind and memory. So you can always be at your best, even under pressure. But is this really the case? Before I give this a try, we need to take a look at the ingredients. Starting with 3.2 grams of carnosin beta alanine which supposedly improves memory and focus. Beta alanine is a non-essential amino acid that combines with the amino acid histidine to form carnosine. Evidence has been well established on the ability of beta alanine supplementation to enhance anaerobic skeletal muscle performance. As a result, beta alanine has become one of the more popular supplements used by competitive athletes. Evidence accumulated over the last few years has suggested that beta alanine can result in carnosine elevations in the brain, which in theory could improve cognitive function. In this study, they gave beta alanine supplementation in soldiers and looked at their mental performance, but the results were inconclusive. Paresthesias, which is the sensation of tingling or numbing in the skin, is the only complication linked to beta alanine supplementation. However, this side effect generally occurs in those taking more than 800 milligrams per kilogram. Another study reported no differences in renal, muscle, and hepatic function markers upon 24 weeks of beta alanine supplementation. So overall, it appears pretty safe, especially at this dose of 3.2 grams. What about one and a half grams of nitrosagine, AKA inositol stabilized arginine silicate, which is an ergogenic aid that upregulates nitric oxide. The claim here is that nitrosagine improves memory and focus, but what does the science say? Overall, the body of research on nitrosagine and cognitive function is still pretty small. This study shows that supplementation does indeed improve working memory and processing speed in young adults, but there's a lack of data examining other cognitive tasks. Then came along this randomized double-blind study in 19 young adults, and the conclusion was that nitrosagine improved memory compared to placebo. This 2018 study examined the effects of nitrosagine on cognitive flexibility among healthy men and women. So cognitive flexibility is the ability to shift attention between different tasks or adapt to new situations. The study found that participants who consumed this supplement showed improvements in cognitive flexibility compared to those who took the placebo. Nitrosagine is a relatively new ingredient in dietary supplements, so the potential side effects are not as well established. So far, it seems to be generally well tolerated with few reported side effects. That said, considering its main component is arginine, it does have the potential for side effects, especially at high doses, things like GI symptoms, 
and a decrease in blood pressure. Then we have peak ATP, which is adenosine 5' prime triphosphate disodium. And the claim here is that it improves energy. This is nothing more than the salt form of ATP, a molecule that plays a crucial role in energy transfer within cells. ATP is often referred to as the energy currency of the cell because it's used to store and transport energy within cells for different biochemical processes. Given that ATP is a naturally occurring molecule in the body, it plays a central role in cellular energy metabolism. It's generally considered safe when consumed in moderate amounts. However, orally ingested ATP might not significantly increase ATP levels in the brain or muscles due to its rapid metabolism. The benefits seen in some studies may be more related to increased blood flow or other mechanisms rather than a direct replenishment of ATP stores in these organs. Also, excessive supplementation can potentially lead to some side effects like GI symptoms, headache, and flushing of the skin. Simply supplementing with ATP doesn't necessarily translate to a noticeable surge in overall vitality or wakefulness in the way that stimulants like caffeine might. And basically, the same thing can be said for Eliv ATP, which is ancient pea extract and apple extract. Then there's S7 with a claim that improves blood flow like nitrosamine. S7 contains green coffee bean extract and green tea extract, which means they contain chlorogenic acids in other bioactive compounds like EGCG, which has been shown in some studies to have vasodilatory effects, meaning it can help dilate blood vessels and potentially improve blood flow. And finally, we have five milligrams of Yohimbe bark extract containing the primary active compound Yohimbine, which has been studied for various potential effects on the human body, including its impact on energy levels. Yohimbine has stimulant properties, which can lead to increased alertness and energy, and some people report mood elevation or reduced feelings of fatigue after consuming it, which can indirectly lead to a perception of increased energy. But some people might experience increased heart rate, elevated blood pressure, anxiety, dizziness, or gastrointestinal symptoms. High doses or prolonged use can amplify these side effects and combining Yohimbe with other stimulants like caffeine can make things worse. In the clinical studies, the doses they typically used were 0.2 mg per kg to 0.3 mg per kg. So for a person who weighs 70 kilos, about 154 pounds, this would translate to a dose of 14 to 21 milligrams. So you've got to be careful about taking this supplement. They recommend one or two of these per day at most. And I recommend checking with your doctor, especially because if you're on other medication, that can impact levels in the body and potentially have harmful effects. Mm. They call this the tiger's blood, watermelon, strawberry, and coconut. That tastes pretty good. We'll see how I feel. So just a quick follow-up, I do feel like it helped with my energy levels being more alert. Um, I wasn't bouncing off the walls or anything but I did feel like overall it gave me a little bit of a boost. Definitely my workout that I had, I typically uh, do strength training, whether that's uh, with weights or with high intensity interval type training. I had a better workout where I wasn't as tired compared to normal. In terms of side effects, I didn't really feel anything. I didn't have any numbness or tingling, didn't have any palpitations or anything. Am I going to completely cut out coffee? No, but uh, this will at least help me cut down on my uh, coffee intake. And I'll probably start taking this on a more regular basis as a pre-workout when I go to the gym.